Hi, my name is Mary, and in today's video I'm going to be sharing with you the books that I have read in autumn of 2019. I accidentally dropped off the face of the booktube earth just a little bit for a couple of months as I was getting settled in my new graduate school program, but that doesn't mean that I wasn't reading. Certainly not, so I thought I would catch you up in my endeavor to hopefully next year, next semester, actually be able to keep up with booktube along with everything else that I have going on. The first book that I'll talk about is this one, A Small Place by Jamaica Kincaid. Now the book promises to be a short and witty kind of aside to mostly American or European tourists who go to Kincaid's home nation of Antigua and Barbuda and take advantage of this tiny little paradise. It's about the legacy of colonialism and it promises to be a kind of lyrical and witty book. The problem that I had with it was that yes, it was angry and it was aimed towards Americans and it was aimed towards the institution of neocolonialism, but it was not lyrical and it was not witty. It was mostly just heaved and I didn't find much literary merit within it, which is not to say that it doesn't have any merit, but it's not what I was personally looking for when I picked the book up. So I give this one two stars. Another book that I picked up this month on audiobook was two short stories by Anthony Trollope. They were Father Giles of Balamoy and Malachi's Cove. Now this is just a short bind up of two short stories, probably took me two hours to read, maybe less. And I, that's about how long it stayed in my brain afterwards. I remember liking Anthony Trollope's writing. However, I couldn't tell you anything about the stories therein. They just did not stick in my mind. So I think I would like to try an Anthony Trollope, but read actually one of his full novels, of course. And he's been on my classics TBR for a little while, especially since I think Katie of Books and Things talked about him quite a bit. She's doing a Trollope project. So hopefully I will be able to also get in on that train and see what all the fuss is about. I think at the time I gave the short stories three stars. The next book that I read was A Vindication of the Rights of Women by Mary Wollstonecraft. Of course, we know Mary Wollstonecraft as well from her daughter, Mary Shelley, but she herself was kind of a badass. She was writing in the 18th century and taking on a philosophical stance that women should be educated as men were. And her argument to this I found extremely lucid. It was very clear, very easy to understand, and I'm just... I'm glad that I read it. It didn't strike me in a really profound way. It was a pleasant reminder of how far things have come, especially in the field of women's education, at least in the United States and in Europe. However, there are, it wasn't as moving as I was hoping it would be, which is fine. She wasn't writing for me several hundred years in the future. That's perfectly fine. I would like to be reading more classic nonfiction. Some classic nonfiction, I think, can stand the test of time and is something that I want to be reading in the 21st century, and some of it certainly isn't. However, I'm glad that I got this one out of the way so I can start developing a classic nonfiction TBR sometime in the future. If you have any classic nonfiction that you would recommend reading, please leave it in the comments down below. I gave A Vindication of the Rights of Women three stars. This month, the Getty Institute kindly sent me an advanced reader copy of Toward a Global Middle Ages, Encountering the World Through Illuminated Manuscripts, edited by Brian C. Keen. This is a catalog from the Getty Museum, which is lavishly and beautifully illustrated with illuminated manuscripts, that is, illustrated books from all over the world. Now, this book takes on board that you are okay with the concept of a global Middle Ages, which is something that I am not fully convinced of. While I think that it's obviously extremely important to study a global history, the concept of taking the European label of the Middle Ages, which is fraught even in Europe, and applying it to the rest of the world, I don't know, is extremely helpful. I don't know. Historical periodization determining what is classical, what is medieval, what is early modern or renaissance, that is a hugely fraught field and this book assumes that argument and assumes that we can do a global middle ages without arguing for it. 
So that was my major problem with it. However, because this book is a collection of essays, the essays within it, I found most of them extremely good. I thought it was very interesting to read, especially some of the essays about what it means to research manuscripts in climates where paper materials, like, uh, like things written on papyrus and things, don't last because they are extremely tropical environments. So what does it mean to have a book and can we say that they never had books just because they don't survive today? There was a lot of very interesting history going on in here and it's something I would recommend if you're interested in the Middle Ages, if you're interested in kind of global Middle Ages, in post-colonial theory, those sorts of things. I ended up giving this book four stars. Lastly, for fun, I read Digital Dieting, From Information Obesity to Intellectual Fitness by Tara Brabazon. Now, Tara Brabazon does videos here on YouTube, so it's kind of funny to be making a video about her work as well. She is the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University in Australia, but she is also a scholar in her own right, kind of in the post or interdisciplinary fields, including media studies, university studies, and she's quite an interesting woman, and I find her videos for PhD students in particular extremely valuable. So I thought I should pick up one of her books. And while I was teaching this semester, which I got to do, I was realizing that there was a problem in my students' writing. And so what was happening was my students were not able to differentiate between good sources of information and not so good sources of information. They weren't able to parse what information was valuable in a university setting, and then they weren't able to put that information in conversation with other information that they were provided in the classroom, which ended up with a lot of essays that sounded exactly the same or a lot of essays that were extremely fragmented because they weren't actually able to do the research. And I had no idea what was happening until I talked to a senior faculty member in my department and realized that what they were having problems with was a problem with information literacy. And I know who has written a book about information literacy, and that is Tara Brabazon. So I picked up Digital Dieting. The premise of this book is taking a food metaphor, the idea that people become obese or overweight because they make poor food choices and poor exercise choices, and applies that intellectually. I thought I might have a bigger problem with this because obviously I am a fat. However, it seemed to work out over the course of things and I wasn't particularly troubled by it. I am in the generation that Tara Brabazon is talking about. This book came out in 2013, which was actually the end of my second year of university, or sorry, the end of my first year of university. So I was in that generation that she was talking about. And I wonder if that's why I was having some problems with the book, because I myself need a little bit of intellectual fitness. But there were parts of this book that I didn't fully see how they integrated into the whole. There's an entire chapter on the iPadification of the university. As someone who will never own an iPad, it didn't seem particularly relevant to me. But there were also other chapters in there where I was struggling to connect them to the whole. The whole is very good. So having one or two chapters that I wasn't so sure about was not a big deal, certainly not an end breaker. I think her chapter on note taking is worth the book in and of itself. It's absolutely magnificent. I also think that if you can't get your hands on the book, because I certainly had trouble getting my hands on it, then I would recommend watching her video on note taking, which I will link in the comments down below. I ended up giving Digital Dieting four stars. Now, when it comes to what I read for graduate school, this is obviously only a small sampling of things that I read, because what I'm including here are books that I read in their entirety. So that's not any of the hundreds of academic articles that I've read this semester, which is a whole thing in and of itself, nor is it incorporating any of the books where I just read chapters of them or parts of them, of which there are also hundreds, because I wrote a lot of research papers this semester and there was a lot of reading and a lot of note taking. So let's get started. One of the first books that I read this semester was called The Epistle of Othea by Christine de Pizan. I talked about Christine de Pizan's other work, The Book of the City of the Ladies, in a previous wrap up, which I will link down below. Christine de Pizan is a medieval writer. She was born in Venice, but lived most of her life at the court of Charles V and Charles VI in France. And The Epistle of Othea, she wrote for some of her royal patrons. First, Louis of Orléans, who was the king's brother, and then the manuscript that I was studying for the semester, she actually gave to Isabel of Bavaria, who was the queen of France. 
So the Epistle of Othea is a book in which a fictional goddess named Othea introduces moral allegories to Hector, who is the Prince of Troy. And Hector kind of stands in for a young male reader, either the Dauphin of France or Louis of Orléans or the King or any of these royal men. And so Othea provides all of this advice. But what's interesting about it is that, at least from my perspective, frequently people do not talk about how people in the Middle Ages talked about and wrote about and conceived of the classical past. So there are stories from the Trojan War in here. There are stories from Greek and Roman mythology. And I think that's so interesting to get her medieval perspective on those events. But there's some interesting things that happen in there. Like Minerva is not a goddess. She's just a woman who was so clever that the ignorant pagans revered her as a goddess, that sort of thing. Very, very interesting. The thing is that I think a lot of people don't read this book because the only English translation of it is a 15th century English adaptation by Stephen Scrope. So you have to read through Middle English to get through it, which is not impossible, but it is a slog. So it takes a very, very short book and makes it into a much longer project. I am very glad that I read this book. I hope a new English translation will be coming out sometime in the near future so I can get more people to read it because I do think that studying how people in the past talked about the past I think is in and of itself very interesting and I absolutely love Christine de Pizan's work and I want to read all of her work eventually. We'll see how it goes. I also read Christine de Pizan's The Epistle of Othea by Sandra L. Hindman. Now this is a book which is all about the Epistle of Othea and three manuscripts that contain that work. I think two of them are in Paris and one of them is in the British Library. And one of those manuscripts was the one that I was researching, so this was an extremely helpful book. I don't know if I would recommend it to a general reader because it is highly specific to you having read the Epistle of Othea and wanting to understand how the manuscript is put together, how the illustrations come in, Christine de Pizan's political ideology. However, for my purposes, very useful. I read through it in a six hour bus ride to get from where I live to New York City. So very, very much worth it. I gave that one five stars. I also read Imagining the Past, History in Manuscript Painting by Elizabeth Morrison and Andy Hedeman. This is a catalog that comes out and it's all about how medieval manuscripts conceived of the past. So very much so like with the Epistle of Othea, people who write medieval manuscripts who wrote them in the past had a very interesting way of conceiving of history before the Middle Ages. And this is a book all about that. It is a massive book, beautifully illustrated. Would highly recommend just to flip through because there's some really beautiful illustrations in here if you are like me and can't get enough of medieval manuscripts. I gave this one, I believe, four stars. It was really pretty great. The essays in it, not all of them were relevant to me, but for the most part, pretty, pretty great. I also read Made in God's Image, Adam and Eve in the Genesis Mosaics at San Marco by Penny Howell Jolly. Jolly is an extremely well-known historian, and this book is all about the visual program of the Genesis Mosaics that tells the story of Adam and Eve in the Basilica of San Marco in Venice. And it was a pleasure to read. I think it was helpful to read the whole thing because I think reading just chapters of it would have been just very confusing. It's an argument that she builds over time because the way that artists depict images is just as important as the images that they choose to depict. And again, I don't know that I would recommend this as relevant to everybody. However, for my research, it was very helpful. So thank you, Jolly. If you want to know the most boring book that I will recommend to you, if you are in any sort of graduate program or undergraduate program or research life and you use the Chicago Manual of Style, please pick up for your own perusal the A Manual for Writers of Research Papers, Theses, and Dissertations by Kate L. Turabian. It is the dumbest thing that I will ever recommend on this channel. However, I was not expecting to like it as much as I did. It was a required textbook for one of my courses this semester as we try to develop ourselves as writers beyond undergraduate writing, which as I've said, it can be a little bit fragmented. And I think it is wonderful. I read it cover to cover, even though we were only assigned a few chapters, my copy is full of highlights, it's full of notes, I have my own set of notes that I've taken from that book of things that I want to remember to do when I write research papers. It is highly useful. 
I think that the things that I liked in it are things that are probably in multiple editions because it's about research practice and I would always recommend looking up online what the current edition of the Chicago like citation guide is because this is so much more than a citation guide. It's a guide to how to research. I give it five stars. The silliest thing I will give five stars this year. Still, highly recommend it. Semester, I also read Lives of Tintoretto by Andrea Calmo. So Tintoretto was an artist who worked in the 16th century in Venice and he is an artist who I find quite fascinating, who I didn't know a ton about before I got started because most people when they study the Renaissance in Venice study a lot of Titian as I did. However, Tintoretto is a fascinating, fascinating man. And what this book is, is a tiny, it's palm sized. I love this tiny, tiny book, but it's just an edited version of some of the early documents about Tintoretto. So it's got an early version of Vasari's Lives um, in which he discusses Tintoretto. Tintoretto doesn't even get his own entry in Giorgio Vasari's bigger works, he being kind of the granddaddy of art history. However, he, it includes that, it includes uh, Carlo Berdolfi, who was also one of Tintoretto's earliest biographers, and just letters about him. It was fascinating. It's really helpful to get one of these good palm-sized edited editions of the critical primary source material, at least in my case. I guess it's technically secondary source material, but I use it as primary sources in my own work because I'm interested in historiography. I definitely gave this one, I think, five stars because it was very helpful. A much bigger book that I picked up was the exhibition catalog for the most recent Tintoretto exhibition at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. That is Tintoretto, Artist of Renaissance Venice by Robert Eccles and Frederick Ilkman. Again, I was interested in what the recent scholarship had said, and it can't get much more recent than last year, because last year was the 500th anniversary of Tintoretto's birth. So there was a lot of interesting Tintoretto stuff happening. I found this catalog very helpful. It is beautifully run like done. It's got wonderful illustrations. It's got really great essays in it. And the bibliography at the back is superb. So highly recommend that one. If you're interested in Renaissance Venice and want like a nice coffee table book to flip through, definitely that one I would recommend. Lastly, I will just briefly mention Goldsmiths by John Cherry. I also did some work on goldsmithing this semester. Not me personally, I have no manual dexterity, but I did research some of the artists who were goldsmiths, including Antonio Palaiuolo and a couple of others. And this was very helpful. It is a tiny, tiny, tiny book. It's the edition that I had had like cardboard covers. So it felt like a children's book just because it was thin, square, and had this kind of cardboard covers but it's chock full of wonderful information and it answered almost all of my questions about goldsmithing. I think I gave it a four star because there were some things that I didn't like, like no references within the actual text, which drives me insane, but definitely worth a read if it's something that you are interested in. And I think this one is actually one that I might recommend for a general audience if goldsmithing in the medieval and early modern periods is of interest to you. All right. So those are the books that I read in autumn of 2019, so September, October, and November. Obviously, this is just a small sliver of books that I actually read, of things that I read, but these are the books that I read in their entirety and finished. I'm going to be doing a rare December TBR just because there are a bunch of books that I want to read now that the semester is winding down and I'm going to have some time at home over the break and I will keep you posted on that. Please let me know what you have been reading lately, catch me up on all the good stuff, and I will talk to you again soon. Bye!